Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to another Hangout with CERN. Today is our second week talking about uh, big data, the grid, and how we do all the calculations we need to do for physics. Um, and we're joined today by experts from uh, CERN, the Netherlands, Croatia, the UK, and Brazil to really highlight um, the worldwide nature of this effort. Um, so, and an exciting thing that came out of CERN's announcement about the end of the uh, run today is also that they've passed a milestone in terms of recording data, 100 petadoids, and we'll learn more about that too. But we're going to start with um, Steve, who's going to tell us about last week. Hi, Seth. Hey, Steve. Hello, everybody. Happy Valentine's Day. I have chocolate, and you don't. Ha <laughs> ha. We're gonna we're gonna have some chocolate here. Get some and, and join us. Uh, yeah, I'd love to give you some. I'll try. I'll try. Okay. So just to recap very quickly, last week we had a, a great time because we talked to some experts, uh, both from IT people in the LHC computing grid, and in the experiments. And they told us about what goes on, why we have to have so much computing. We learned that the LHC, which is a very large collider, has four different collision points. And at those points, a huge amount of data is generated because we record up to 30, or there's up to 30 million collisions a second going on. And we record a bunch of that data. Uh, the, the experiments, a typical LHC experiment, spitting out almost a petabyte of data per second at us is being thrown at the experiments. They filter that out. They keep one in 10 million events with something called a trigger, which is a great topic for another hangout. But we still, after that, have hundreds of gigabytes of data per second coming out of these experiments that we have to deal with. CERN, for the first time ever, said there's no way that we can handle all that. So they decided to build an infrastructure called the computing grid, and it is a tiered structure. Tier zero is here at CERN. That's where we do the first number crunching of all that data, first pass. Then we ship it out to about a dozen or so different places around the globe where another bit of processing is done that refines things a bit, uses a bit more information about the detectors to refine that data, and then it ships it out to tier two centers, which are located at institutes all around the globe, lots of institutes, and those institutes handle the analysis. So when us physicists decide we want to look for something like, let's say, the Higgs, for example, we submit a job that goes to one of those tier two centers, whichever one has the right data, and gets processed, and we get our results back. It's a huge infrastructure. We learned the word middleware, because that's apparently extraordinarily important. That's what help, helps keep everything going. It, it, it's what handles where to put data and where the, where the stuff is and where to put the jobs. And it's very complex, but it's managed, as you just said, a hundred, a hundred, hundred what? hundred petabytes. petabytes. <laughs> you know how much 100 petabytes is? 100 million gigabytes. That's a lot. It handles that much data up until now. Okay, so that's, that's the big recap. Back to you. Yeah, well, um, the, let's uh, actually, since we've been saying so much about petabytes, uh, let's go now to Herman at CERN uh, to explain what's going on with these 100 petabytes um, that we've now recorded. Hi. So I am right now at the CERN Computer Center, as you can see. And this is where we store those famous 100 petabytes where we crossed the line. We went above 100 petabytes of storage uh, during this run, during the heavy iron run. And uh, so I'm looking after the tape storage at CERN together with, uh, with my team. And uh, so where to start? I mean, this is, this is a very big number. Um, the example we're giving is this corresponds to more than 700 years of high-definition video being stored on, you know, on Blu-ray media, for example. It also corresponds to what Facebook had as a total storage last year, around uh, June last year, when we went public. It's quite, it is an enormous amount of data, and uh, while quite a lot of this data has been coming back, I mean, the archive has been there. We have been collecting data since 
around 20 years, but most of the data has been actually generated by the LHC experiment over the last three years. There are around 75 petabytes of data which have been collected over three years. And uh, so with the shutdown now, we're going to go a little bit down with the rate because there won't be any raw data. There will be data being reprocessed. There will be analysis data coming in. But after the shutdown, we're going to go up again and even collecting more data than that. We expect to have 50 to 60 petabytes a year. So we're not stopping. It's just a pit stop, if you want. All right. Thanks, Herman. Um, we have some, some questions maybe you could answer, actually, that we collected on YouTube after mm -hmm. last week. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how much we store per second? And maybe we can go to the picture of the LHC. Um, and you can tell us a little bit about yes. what, what's in this data we process. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's a nice picture. Yeah, exactly. So where we can see a little bit the data rates from the LHC experiments down to the CERN Computer Center. Now, first of all, this data rates, they were as the system was designed to be. In reality, we're receiving much more data than that. When the LHC experiment experiments are collecting data, we receive an average between two to three gigabytes a second. That's quite more than the sum of what the, of the figures you're seeing over there. And during peak rates, we have been collecting up to seven gigabytes a second. So it's quite a lot of data which we have to collect. We have to, first of all, what we do to explain you a little bit the workflow, how it goes, the data is being written to disk, then um, we start to read it out from disk and send it to tape, magnetic tape. So what we have at CERN here in the computer center, we have eight tape libraries. Each library can hold up to you know, 14,000 cartridges. And we buy cartridges, which are then being mounted via robotics, and they are being written with the data. So we have around 52,000 tape cartridges, which have a capacity for 1 to 5 terabytes each. And this is where we store most of the data. There's also data which, um, and this is for the physics raw data, for the reconstructed data. We also have a disk-based facility where we store um, analysis data from end users. And there we have around 13 petabytes. So on tape, we have around 88 petabytes of data. And on disk, yet another 13 petabytes of data. And this is data, maybe just to mention, this is data we store in principle, at the turnum, so we don't delete the data unless the user decides to delete the data. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Um, now we should. I know everyone expects a quiz question, a trivia question from us for every week. So let's go back to Steve and hear oh, today's oh, trivia I got one. question. I got All one. Right. I got one. Let's hear it. Okay. So, so you saw behind behind Germán, there was there was a lot of computing. I don't know if you can put Germán up there. Uh, there's a lot of computing. You see computers behind him. We have a lot of computers at CERN and, and all over the world. Now let's go back in time just a little bit. And I want you to tell me if you can name CERN's first computer. CERN's first computer. And tell us what makes that computer different than all of the subsequent computers ever since. Okay? That's our question, Seth. All right. Great. So you can post that comment um, on, on YouTube or Google Plus or wherever you are, um, and we, we should see it. And so we'll see who um, gets the answer to that first. Um, all right. Now let's go uh, around the world to all of our um, computer experts who can uh, tell us a little bit more about where they are, what their work has to do with what we're doing right now, uh, which tier they're at, if they're at a tier one or tier two, because some of them are. Uh, so how about we start with uh, Daniela? Yes, hi. Uh, well, I am uh, currently at the Dutch tier one, which is located in Amsterdam. To uh, be more specific, at NICAP, which is the uh, National Institute for High Energy Physics. So yeah, quite naturally, since most of our scientists are particle physicists, uh, the grid resources are located here, and we play the role of being a uh, tier one. So, uh, well, since CERN has the privilege of being the tier zero, this is where uh, the raw collisions data comes from, of course. And as soon as that data is available, <clears throat> part of it is distributed to each tier one site. 
So our role is to actually to process this data. Uh, this is so-called reconstruction as a step uh, in the computing model. I think it was discussed uh, previously. So uh, this actually means that the events from the collisions are reconstructed and they are sort of stored in a format that is more convenient for the next processing step. We also store this new data at, uh, at NICEF, and in addition, in addition, we uh, archive the original raw data that was sent to us. It's sent to special uh, uh, custodial storage, it's called tape, it's meant to be kept forever. Terrific. So, uh, Daniela, maybe I can ask you, because we have questions um, from Tulos and Ruhal Bubal on YouTube um, that you touched on a little bit. Um, one of them is how long is the data stored for? I guess you said forever, but maybe you can say more about that. And another one uh, was what format is the data in? Um, well, the, the data is in a custodial format. It's called root, and it's, uh, I, I assume it's the most optical, op optimal, uh, sorry, data format that there is. But it's uh, really something, the project that it's uh, homegrown at CERN. I guess the database experts know more about this, but. Uh, uh, well, yes. Uh, and the second question was, sorry. Um, let's see here. Just how, how long is how long is the data oh, yeah. planned to be stored for? It's uh, it's meant to be there forever, especially the uh, data that is uh, on tape on archival. This 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 is a very peculiar storage type. Uh, it's simple, but it's complex at the same time. I mean, uh, the advantage is that uh, it's very cheap, but uh, on the other hand. The data access is uh, rather slow. It can be in the order of seconds, even minutes, because there is an actual physical robot that is taking the tape uh, mm. next to this cache so that users can uh, access it. Uh, but yeah, the, the idea is that this kind of data is uh, written once and preferably never read unless there is some uh, recovery that must be done. Cool. Thank you. Um, how yeah, about maybe, we? Maybe oh, to to, um, on this topic of data access, I mean, you one has to see data on disk being something complementary to data on tape. Yeah. Um, what you have on the advantage of storing data on disk is that you have um, high concurrency, so you can serve the data to many different users in parallel, and you have a very low latency. So this means the access from the moment on that the user says, I want to access the data, to the moment where he can open up the file and access his contents is very fast. On the other hand, with tape, what you have is, I mean, tape is not slow. Um, this is a, a little bit of a misconception. But what you have is that there's a high latency for getting up to reading or writing data, which is on tape. But once you are there, I mean, tape drives are faster than disk drives nowadays. You can reach 250 megabytes per second on a tape drive. So if you run in parallel, you can get data streams, a multiple of what you are currently achieving. So we could get up much higher. But it is true. It's not something which is aimed to be. It's not the best technology for giving access to end users who are doing skimming over files, who are doing quite a lot of random access to files. It's rather for bulk storage and bulk retrieval. Thanks. All right, now let's um, introduce Amir. And I think uh, instead of a national flag, you've got your institute logo up. <laughs> Uh, yeah, appropriate yeah. for today. So, why don't you tell <laughs> yeah, us? I'm so happy. Yeah. So, uh, my name is Amir. I'm, I work at the University Computing Center in Croatia. Um, happy Valentine's Day! Uh, I was invited here here due to the nice logo that we have of our <laughs> institute because the name of the institute in Croatian actually means heart. Um, so, unlike a tier one that uh, was just pre presented by Daniela, we don't really have that much resources here. We only provide uh, fifty terabytes of disk and uh, 200 cores. Uh, what we actually do is uh, operations within the EGI infrastructure, which is actually the, the grid infrastructure which uh, provides uh, resources and uh, services to, to LHC and some other area of science like biomed, VNMR, and others. 
and also what we do is um, we work on the uh, monitoring system which is responsible on detecting uh, the situation when some of these sites uh, which are some of these tier ones and tier twos uh, once they once they are not working properly mm -hmm. and this is actually done with a wider team at CERN called SAM and that's what we do here. Terrific. Thank you. Um, how about Renato now? So, hi. I'm a system administrator at the uh, Universidade de São Paulo in Brazil. And we are a tier, do tier 2 site. And we have about the same resources as the MIR site. We have around 200 cores and uh, around uh, 70 terabytes of storage. And uh, I started here about uh, two years ago, and uh, the institute already had like a, a, a cluster with these resources, and uh, they asked me to install the grid software, the grid middleware, as uh, Steven mentioned, and uh, to become a part of the grid. So uh, as a small site, we have just begun the process of becoming a, a grid site per se, and uh, in these two years, I have to say that the learning curve was really hard, but uh, the, the accomplishments are very big, and uh, uh, the, the fact that we out now have uh, grid jobs running meant that our computer, our, our cluster, is full 100% of the time, and that allows us to uh, have more uh, negotiating power with our funding agencies. So any other small uh, clusters around there that want to become part of the uh, grid, they are sh that is surely a very good option for them. All right. Thank you. And uh, finally, uh, Freya, one of our, our regular hosts and participants, you're in Bristol this week. And why don't you and your guests introduce yourselves? Hi, Seth. Yeah, uh, today I am uh, actually this most of this week I am in Bristol. Now, as you guys know, I actually only analyze the data, so I don't really know that much uh, about how the grid works. I'm a user of the grid, but I do have somebody here who actually is doing his part of well part of his PhD actually on uh, the next uh, steps that we're going to take. So this is Lucas. Uh, hi, everyone. And Lucas, maybe you hi. can t say a bit about what you're. Doing. Um, yes, uh, I'm a PhD here at the University of Bristol, and we have one of the smaller tier two centers um, here. So we have around 100 terabytes of storage, and I think around 200 um, cores, so quite, uh, quite small in comparison. Um, however, we also have a nice experimental cluster here, which uh, has more capa uh, capabilities. And uh, there we investigate the use of uh, new technologies, which uh, Google and Facebook use for big data to actually use for our purposes. Great. Thank you. So I think, well, I've got the two of you here, where we've sort of got a grid user and um, operator on, on the same screen. I'll, I'll pass on a question from... Uh, Beatrice from Google Plus, which was, what software do we use for mining our big data? So, well, uh, yeah, well, it depends. Eh? So the, the software I use, we, we the, the physicists write their own software, and uh, that tends to be written in C++ with some Python, and uh, it, uh, oh yeah, uh, for those of you who have seen phys how physicists write code, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a bit of an experimental process. Uh, and you can maybe say a bit more about uh, how we actually, what happens to uh, our code after that. Well, luckily we developed the code uh, within the framework usually. So um, um, we, we are supported by experts um, who um, c can code better than we do. So basically as a physicist, you would put your code, which ca uh, several algorithms, which uh, kind of mines the data in the way you want, and then you would use our grid submission system to send um, your code to where the data is located. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, since we have everyone introduced and we've got a few questions on the way, uh, this is really our chance to hear new questions um, from people who had them from last week. So let's go to uh, Ken now and uh, hear what we've got right, right off, hot off the presses. OK. Hey, thanks a lot, Seth. Well, the questions are coming in on Twitter and YouTube. Uh, Mechanistra on Twitter asks, 
So how much time does it take to run in a job that needs to query one of your large data sets? If you need to ask a short question, but to a large data set, how long would that job take? Wow, okay. Anybody want to jump up and field this one? All right, go for it. Hi. Um, well, first of all, it depends on the queues. Um, so if you have a big conference coming up, the queues are really quite full, and it take, can take a day or two <laughs> until your job starts. Right, but if your answer is really very short, uh, you can get it as fast as in a few hours if you're lucky. Uh, a few but hours to go through all of the data. If if you were going yeah, through, that's because we do it in parallel, huh? So you don't run an every everything uh, one event after the other. You split your job up as much as you can, and then every one of those little jobs all only needs to look at a little part of the data. So and the more you par do this in parallel the better it is. When I do analysis, sometimes part of the data that I'm looking at is in Brazil, while other parts are in the US, while other parts are in uh, in Bristol and uh, or in Croatia. And uh, then we and then I'm running all the different parts at the same time. And that way it can be done relatively fast. So is your Brazilian Higgs any different than your Croatian Higgs? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> it's closer. Ours is closer. <laughs> I imagine there's a lot of tests to make sure that there's agreement, right? Yeah. That's a, that's an interesting interesting point, but I think we have multiple copies of the data and we in in different places and at some point we can see that they're really the same. Yeah, um, I, I I've actually heard there there's many processes done to test things like this. Uh and even in modern computing, uh you can have uh slight changes to computers which can give you a slightly different answer, which is important. And that there are processes which actually vote. So you have uh, different processes giving you the solution. And if nine out of ten give you one answer, you select that one over the ten. It can be quite complex to uh, a multiprocessor. Hey, Ken, you have another question for us? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, well, you were, I'm going to jump ahead because you were very close to almost answering this question. Alexander the Optimist on YouTube asks, so how many backup servers do you have? And it gets you into the question that you were almost answering on data redundancy and multiple copies. OK, how many backup servers do we have? Uh, Daniela, do you want to take this one? Uh, well, it depends on the configuration. But yeah, but the, the way we um, outline our disks are uh, in this so-called write configuration. So this is. Uh, uh, known as redundancy, redundant array of high-speed disks. And it's basically a storage technology that has, um, well, a strong resilience. In other words, it, it's, it's fault tolerant. So, I mean, there are several different configurations, but it's set up in a way, uh, it's set up in such a way as to protect against losing when a disk dies for some reason. So, it's basically uh, configured in a smart way to divide and, and, and to replicate chunks of, of, the, of this data in a smart way that the, that the probability of actual loss of data, like uh, complete loss of data, is, um, is, uh, is minimal. But it really depends, I mean, on, on a tier one side. I, I don't have the precise statistics of how many uh, disk servers we have, but we have a lot, uh, around two petabytes of data, at least, uh, reserved for LHCB, since I'm uh, the contact for LHCB. But uh, probably there is a lot more. And in fact, well, we are kind of a peculiar tier one site because uh, our data is just stored across our institute at SARA, which is a big uh, data center, a computing center also, maybe the biggest one in, uh, in Holland. So that's where the data is stored. Thank you. Yeah, can uh, I ask a question, sir? Yeah, sure. It has to do with, with uh, understanding the difference between tier zero and tier one. I understand that you know when tier zero, their job is to get the data through at real time. The data is getting thrown out at, at it from the, the triggers of all, all of these detectors, and it comes fast and furious, and it has to process it in real time, and then ship it out to you guys, at your tier ones. Now, you had told us, Daniela, that um, you then do a reprocessing, and you, you create different formats 
when you do that reprocessing, I think there's another kind of data that gets added into the mix to get you something refined. Yes. What, yeah. Can you tell me what that is? Well, so the raw data, once this raw data is processed, what you have is not just pure raw data, but something resembling events, so something that mm -hmm. is more uh, tangible that can then go to the next phase, which is uh, called stripping, and that phase basically means selecting events that are of a particular importance for the working group. And it's, uh, it's also slightly different for what uh, so once the data is stripped, then actually it becomes available for the physics group to analyze it. And all of this is stored partially at every uh, tier one. Okay. I guess, I guess I was just getting at the idea that you also, uh, you add into there also conditions data, I think, uh, gets put into the formula there. Meaning that all the information that tells us the alignment and calibration of the detectors has to be processed simultaneously. Yeah. And that helps to give this refined uh, version as well. Excellent. Uh, let's let's go back to Ken for I think we're going to have time for maybe one more question. Okay. Uh, well, there's another question concerning redundancy and resiliency. Fingolian on Twitter wonders. So, if you think about it, over the whole LHC grid, there's so many hard drives. What would be your estimate for how many hard drives need to be replaced per year? All right. Um, Let's go. Well, let's let's go straight to Herman, back to CERN, and and hear the the big numbers, <laughs> hard drive replacements per year. So I don't have this figure, but I can look at that. Something I can tell you is that indeed, I mean, hard drives um, have a higher failure rate than uh, tape media, because of their, I mean, or their mechanic uh, mechanical characteristics. I mean, they're spinning most of the time, while as tape media is only moving whenever you are really accessing uh, data out of it. And uh, there is a difference which is one or two orders of magnitude of higher failure rates with hard disks than with tape storage. Now, something we do at CERN for the disk-based pool system we have set up, we, rather than setting up RAID arrays, we have copies, two copies of the data on standard hard disks. And whenever there's a failure, we have an automatic mechanism so that you disable the hard disk which is failing and you start immediately a replication so that the operators can collect the hard disks offline without affecting standard uh, uh, standard access to the data. Now, for the figure, this I can easily take out and send it to you. All right. Uh, I think uh, let's go to Luke and Freya, I think, have a number for us for the amount of replacements. Yeah, I think if I remember correctly, it's more or less uh, one uh, disk per day per uh, tier one. So if, if you have uh, a large amount of disks, you will get a failure a day. And of yeah. course, if, you, if you're unlucky and get a power cut, it can be more. All right. Um, and maybe do, for, for some of the smaller sites, maybe Amir, do you have a, a comment on how many? No, no unfortunately. <laughs> I agree with Herman, so the, 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 we don't have that many problems with tapes, but uh, the figure is significantly smaller than once per day. I think we have maybe several of them per year, and that really depends on how, how much the, the disk systems are used. Thanks. All right, we are going to need to wrap up soon, so I think it's time to go back to Steve so we can see about the uh, trivia answer. Well, I think I think I know the answer, but Ken is the man who's been following the social media, and I believe maybe Ken has. And Ken, do you know? Did somebody answer the question? Absolutely. Uh, the question was posed at eleven o eight Eastern, and at eleven o nine Eastern, Mr. J. R. Gregory on YouTube correctly answered that Willem or Vim Klein was the world's was was CERN's first human computer. He came to CERN in 1958 and was a human calculator. At 11.10, Metalgimp on YouTube correctly answered that what was different about this calculator than all of CERN's subsequent calculators is that this one was human. And the calculational uh, techniques that he could perform were very impressive. OK, back to you. Right. It was That's amazing. really interesting. It was amazing. I, I actually heard I, I had a chance to talk to Mick Storr, who you might remember was on our very first Hangout. 
and uh, he was remembering this. He uh, he saw, he learned about this guy uh, who came on and gave a performance, which you can find uh, on the CERN web pages. So if you if you get to CERN.ch and do some searching uh, for Wim Klein, uh, and we maybe we can put a link up later on uh, on our CERN.ch slash hangout page. Uh, he was he was faster in some ways than the first non-human computers that they put in here. They had challenges, and he was able to calculate the umpteenth root of some number faster than, than it took to, to get the job out to the to the IBMs or to whatever was was there, and, and have it do the calculations. So a really amazing person. You should, you should read about him. I, I want to be, before I, I uh, we we hang up here. I want to to uh, show you my guest. Okay, I have uh, Kelly, uh, Kelly Islar, who's a intern who's just been here for a week now, maybe? A week and a half. A week and a half. So she's still wet behind the ears, and she's learning all about CERN. Kelly comes from the U.S. Uh, there are a lot of people come to CERN from a variety of different areas to do a variety of different things. Kelly's expertise is, is in communication. And uh, you you work for US LHC Communications, so you learn about things and you write them up. Mm -hmm. And so you might have read some of her articles, or you will write some, write some articles that they will eventually. read eventually. <laughs> eventually, soon, I hope. Um, and Kelly, did did you have a question that you wanted to pose to these experts? Yeah, just one quick question for you guys. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but if you could put it in terms of like a home PC or a home computer, how many computers make up the grid? Ah, how many of my laptops? 300,000, give or take, divided by two, let's say. Well, these are, I mean, these are not the kind of desktops or laptop, laptops that you have at home. I mean, uh, it's uh, it's it's a bit more compact form of a PC. It's the basic part, and they, they typically a node can have up to maybe even 24 cores, and they are all stacked up in a rack the size of a small cabin. So at least I can say for Nikef, and maybe we actually are somewhat dense of uh, all the resources that there are. Um, we have. Something like four thousand cores. So you do the math <laughs> for the rest. But there's plenty of uh, Four thousand cores, and how many tier one centers? There's there's a dozen or so. Uh, yeah, there's a dozen of, or so. Yes, uh, for LHTV, we use seven, but in total, I think there's something between ten and fifteen. Well, so maybe but you can say fifty thousand. I don't know who, who has it. Anybody have a better estimate? More, no, if you if you look at the EGI infrastructure uh, that we have now, which pretty much which most of it supports the LHC experiments, we have three hundred thousand cores. So that's that's why I said it's if you if you assume that your laptop has two cores, you could um, approximate to one hundred one hundred and fifty thousand laptops. But that will be a really rough approximation. As Daniela said, you can't really map it one to one. But if you only look at the course and ignore the the disks, it's uh, one hundred and fifty thousand. All right, all right. Thank you. It is not too far away. I mean, if you take laptops, say with a one terabyte hard disk, and uh, you look at what we are storing at CERN, which is hundred petabytes, which is hundred thousand um, terabytes. So that makes up hundred thousand uh, laptops just in storage capacity. All right, and now we're going to um, go to one final question that we saw on Facebook beforehand, I think, and informs everything. Um, so I'll have, have Renata take this one. Uh, the question is, we've stored all this data. What next? Well, the answer to that is really simple, more, because we have this amazing machine that uh, is really expensive to was really expensive to build and it, it is really expensive to maintain. So we, we want to get as much data as possible from it as soon as possible. And a, a more subtle answer is what's there? Uh, we have this 100 petabytes of data, so now we need a lot of people asking the right questions and doing analysis on our grid. Uh -huh. 
Terrific. I think it was uh, it was uh, Joe, wasn't it? It's the CMS spokesperson who described the challenge uh, of finding the Higgs. And he put it very well. He said, you know, the number of collisions that happened uh, in these detectors, this is just CMS and Atlas, it was equivalent to a swimming pool full of grains of sand, where each grain of sand is one of the collisions. And this is some time ago. This was only at the mere 500 trillion collisions that had happened. We collected not all of that. We collected a lot of that. And the number of grains of sand that allowed us to declare that we had discovered a boson was the amount you would get if you licked your finger and stuck it into that swimming pool. That's the number of grains of sand it really took. You know, maybe a, a few hundred told us that we had something. And that was a, a, a very fundamental discovery for, for mankind. So now what's going to happen is very bright people are going to be looking through this data for the next two years and finding other great things. I'm sure of that. There's a lot of stuff in that data already. And then we'll start adding to it. But I think even then, Seth, isn't it true that over the next two years we're going to be using that grid even even more, right? Yeah, I expect so. I, I certainly have a lot of analysis work to do myself. Uh -huh. and, and simulation right. is big, right? We're going to be going up to 14 TeV, which is completely new. So at least I know for Atlas we have to simulate a lot of data to know what we're going to expect. We've, we've got to get ready for the next thing. So we should um, finish up now, um, but let maybe Steve, you can tell us about our um, special episode on next week's Hangout with CERN. Well, okay, next week's Hangout. Actually, you know what we should do? Is, is she hiding over there at the computing center? Is our executive producer Kate <laughs> over there? Yeah, she's hiding. Kate, can you come in here? Here's the, she, she's the one who runs the show and, and, and arranges everything, and she's got us a special link up uh, with Google. Uh, science fair next week. Isn't that right, Kate? That's correct, Steve. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we, uh, so CERN is one of the partners of the Google Science Fair, which is out at the moment. It's open for 13 to 18 year olds to submit their fantastic projects. And uh, since we're a partner of this great competition, we're going to do a special hangout next week uh, that's going to be. Uh, introduced by them, but then over to us. If all goes to plan, we're going to have Joe Candela and Fabiola Giannotti. Did I get that right? Uh, so these are the two spokespeople on the 4th of July last year that announced the discovery of this new particle. So they're going to be joining us next week. And fingers crossed, we're going to have Joe connecting from underground, 100 meters underground, at the CMS cavern. So now that wow. this, this week we've had the, we've, well, today we've seen the last, uh, the last beam for this LHC run. So that means now we can open up underground. We can go down. So fingers crossed we're going to see Joe from underground. We're going to see Fabiola above ground. And uh, we can get questions from people about uh, whatever they want to ask these two spokespeople. So it should be good. Uh, that's yeah. really, really exciting. <laughs> All right, uh, we are now going to call it a day. So thanks so much to all of our experts from around the world. Um, hey, and, and we, uh, Seth, Seth, we need yeah. to give a virtual chocolate here, a virtual uh, yeah. chocolate to the answer of, of, the, uh, of the trivia quiz, OK? <laughs> all right. Can we give a virtual hug? I don't know. Do we give him a virtual hug again? <laughs> all right. Let's uh, let's do do our um, virtual hug right after I plug one more thing, which is okay. people ask um, people ask how they can help, and so I wanted to mention again that we have this um, program called the uh, LHC at Home that lets you use your computer to do some calculations um, as part of the program, and you can learn more about it at uh, cern.ch/lhc at home. Um, and now, yes, for the the winners of our, our trivia quiz, let's uh, give a, a worldwide group hug before we sign off. Yay. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> Good job. Good job, everybody. <laughs> All right. Now I'll eat the virtual chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy okay. it, Steve. All right. Thanks so much to everyone, and um, come back next week.
拜拜，拜拜，拜拜，拜拜。